Good afternoon, Omaha. We are back for the uh, latest edition of the Half Court Press podcast. I'm Dirk Chatlin. I'm joined by Joel Lorenzi. Uh, we have seen a whole lot of crummy basketball over the last few weeks, Joel. Uh, I think Creighton's last win was November 22nd. If I'm if I'm right about is that. that, the Arkansas game, uh, and <laughs> and tomorrow is December 22nd, or two days from now is December 22nd when they'll play their next one. Yep. Scheduled to play their next one, so a full month of a basketball season for a top ten team without a win. That's hard to do, Joel. That it is hard to do. Yeah, I can't say I'm surprised after about three of those losses. Like I can't say I'm super shocked. Like. Um, you could, I mean, you could like, as soon as Kalkbrenner went down, I was like, okay, you kind of know where this thing is trending. Um, and I could have said as much about the Marquette game, but like losing like BYU and um, the way they lost Arizona State, like um, looking back on it now, like we probably should have knew this after like the third loss. Yeah, but, you, but usually, maybe. usually you're going to get <laughs> a buy game or something to break it up, right? Like this is really unusual for yeah. for a team with with these kind of, you know, projections uh and expectations to go through a stretch like this. Just like I said, partly because usually you just get lucky with the schedule, right? Like yeah. you run into a home game that you that you win. Um and Creighton, you know, I think to their credit, they scheduled they scheduled with difficulty. Yep, uh, they scheduled hard. with high expectations, but uh, but it, man, it it bit them here over the last few weeks. And, and maybe some of it is our fault. Maybe we we popped them up too high. Um, same thing with with North Carolina, right? Maybe we popped them up too high. Um, there's a lot some, of similarities there. There's something to be said about um, you know taking a team's run that they finished with the previous season, adding to that or retain what they retain the continuity and. Maybe what they add to that, taking that at, at face value and saying, "Hmm, maybe we shouldn't expect the craziest leap." Now, I do think the schedule, um, like you mentioned, like there's just so many factors that that brought this team here. But um, I do think now we look back and maybe there are a few teams we shouldn't have propped up so high, but it, it just felt too right, right? Like it just felt too good for well for these teams. let's let's lean into that and I don't, I don't want to turn everybody into a you know North Carolina podcast uh, but but like Carolina lost one of their most important players Brady Manick right spread the floor hit jump shots bailed them out of bad possessions um, <laughs> really really critical player Creighton lost a really critical player Ryan Hawkins a couple um, if you ask a few people in the program with O'Connell. O'Connell, yeah. Uh, you know, a uh, uh, a floor spreader, uh someone who hits jump shots, athletic, you know, defensive. <coughs> uh but but Carolina, they went on a real run. Okay? Yep. Uh Creighton did not go on a real <laughs> run. Yeah. Okay? Like I I think we have to rewrite history a little bit here and, and I I'm not trying to, you know, knock the program, but but Joel, they were not like lighting it up in March last year. Okay. Yeah. They they beat Providence in the Big East tournament by a lot. That was an impressive win. But they lost to Villanova in the Big East final. They probably should have lost the first round game to San Diego State. Uh we're basing a lot of these expectations on the fact that they played Kansas closer than anybody else. Right? Uh yeah. we're we're basically building an off season of expectations around that game and the fact that they returned a lot of experience, a lot of sophomore talent, uh, and then they were, you know, they were adding Baylor Shireman, who uh, was was one of the best transfers on the market. So, I think I don't want to go back and say we were wrong about this team, right? Uh, because I do think they had the components to be one of the top ten teams in the do. country, and they still do. Yeah. But I, I think I just think we need to be careful about saying, you know, this was based on the fact that they finish the season so well because eh, you know and, and I think maybe the thing we need to be saying is we shouldn't have been so quick to thrust them into that they didn't that make the leap like I expected them to make right and that t- that thing takes time but we knew looking at the team like <clears throat> like you mentioned with North Carolina they lose Brady Manic, obviously a big uh, movement shooter for that team and just spot up and gritty 
elbow, throwing elbow type guy. Like, um, and the thing with North Carolina was obviously they made a legitimate run. Like that team sucked before they they were a bubble team before the they tournament. Were, yeah, they were worse than Creighton yeah. going into it was really March first. Watch them. I I grew up a North Carolina fan, and that team really it was unlike most North Carolina teams I watch. And they somehow wound up in the championship because they're getting the best play out of their players come March. Um, and when you take away Brady Manick, like, there was a couple guys that could have filled that slot, um, including Matt Meyer, who ended up at Illinois, a really good player. I thought he would have uh, basically mirrored that role for them. Um, but they ended up with Pete Nance, who was a really good player himself. Um, maybe doesn't play that role to a T, but offers different things. Now, he does complicate the lineups in some ways. This isn't going to turn to a UNC podcast, like you mentioned, but um, – the Pete Nance addition made it feel like it was a perfect, seamless fit because he could slide at the four. Obviously, there's some complications there um, that make it seem like maybe he'd be better at the five. Uh, so not the perfect fit. And maybe you could argue the same with, with, Shireman. with Shireman. Like not not like he can't perfectly fit into the three-man, but it depends on who you're looking for him to replace. Do you want him to replace O'Connell? I do want him to replace Hawkins. Now, he can't do everything Hawkins can. Like, we saw that with the empty side post of last game. It worked for a few possessions. Then Marquette started actually trying. Um, and now it's like it, – it, it just depends on what you were looking for out of him. And I think that's what we had to look at when we, you know, decided the expectations for this team and really decided how soon are they going to be as good as we think they are because they added one of the best transfers in the league and kept all these guys who, like you said – play Kansas closer to anybody. I, I think the expectation, <laughs> the, the offseason hype, in my opinion, was validated by how they played the first two games in Maui. Yeah. Okay. So course. to say that, oh, Creighton, you know, was never that good, I think those two games proved that that their ceiling is really, really high. Yeah. But I think we can break down the problems into three areas. One, the sophomores haven't taken the leap that we expected them to take. Okay, uh, <coughs> Kaluma and Alexander and Nemhard. Two, Kalkbrenner's injury or Kalkbrenner's sickness. Illness, yep. um, huge, huge factor, right? Huge factor. And three is just the intangible connection between these guys, chemistry you might call it, uh, that, that Joel, you have a better read on that than I do, uh, being around the team more. I thought Shireman was going to be a seamless fit and there, you know, there's some people out there who just don't think that it's working in part because they, they traded, you know, Hawkins for Shireman from an intangible standpoint. Um, and and I, I, I'm hopeful that that can change, <coughs> you know, but, but I think it's, I think you could reasonably argue at this point that Creighton, the pieces just don't fit together very well. Uh, which is odd because two months ago I would argue that the pieces fit perfectly. So what is your read? On the, I want to ask you two things. What is your read on the sophomore slump? And two, what is your read on on sort of the chemistry of this team and how Shireman, you know, influences that? Sure. And now ask me that second question again when I, after I answer the first one because I know I'm going to forget. It, but um, the the sophomore slump, I I was asked this on the radio uh, maybe yesterday, and looking at the full, like we got a healthy sample size now, like we got a full slate of data and. I feel like um, that, like you said, I can't speak to a genuine jump yet, but you've seen flashes. Like um, part of why they look like they could beat anybody in the country in Maui was Nemhard delivered one of the best performances of anybody on this team all year. Um, Trey Alexander was pretty efficient in what he did. Now the only one who really played bad off the top of my head was Kaluma, who was rattled that entire week. What can you do? Um, I've been disappointed in his development but you also got to be patient with him because he did have that surgery in the summer and obviously um, it's going to take time to get to the point where maybe scouts and and fans expect him to be so I've been probably more patient with him than anybody even though it has been disappointing like you you've at least expected him to not have games where he has six turnovers or doesn't look completely out of it uh, or doesn't make a shot at all Um, but but yeah so like that was performances like that were why we thought, mm, like, this team is where it needs to be. The, the sophomores did make that jump. But you look down a stretch, man, and um, and it kind of leaks into the, the whole chemistry thing, right? I don't, I don't think there's a problem with their chemistry, but I do think, like, 
there hasn't been a guy with a genuine backbone like like Hawkins that could really put their foot down and be like, yo, like we have to take this thing in this direction or it's going to spiral out. And you know what, Joel? It's probably easier for a senior to do that with freshmen than it is with sophomores, right? Like yeah. those guys are coming in last year, have never done it. <coughs> uh, and I think Hawkins' leadership is probably more valuable in that situation than when you're trying to lead guys who just played Kansas in the NCAA tournament, right? Um, so maybe that's part of it too. I the the Shireman thing is really is really odd because um, again, on paper, skill wise, I thought it was gonna be perfect. Like I thought he was gonna basically enhance everybody else. And there's still time to do that probably, but it doesn't it doesn't look like he's making guys better. Um I'm not saying it's his fault, but it just it's not quite what I expected in sure. terms of the fit. Well, <clears throat> I think Kalkbrenner is necessary for him to really work as best as possible because you've seen guys, you've seen games like like the game against Marquette. There are times where it becomes stagnant because guys aren't moving or like when they rely on Baylor to create. Like there was times, and I'm still debating on what it was that really went down, but there were possessions you saw Baylor like trying to initiate. Uh, maybe without a ball screen or with a ball screen, whatever. And the guys around him are like kind of just watching him. And I think it's because maybe they don't want to complicate his spacing. Yeah. Um, but also, like, I don't know. Like, I'm still debating on, on what it really was. But in cases like that, like, if, if he needs all the space in the world to initiate and really get pain touches and um, he can't – like, he has to, like, not have guys bumping into him and, uh, you know, the defense really rubbing up on him, like – if every situation has to be near perfect for him to genuinely create, then you're right. Um, maybe the fit wasn't as seamless. I thought that um, he'd be able to get into the teeth of the defense basically whenever he wanted because even though he's not a shifty ball handler, he's a real reactionary ball handler and um, kind of like a like a Jalen Brunson or something, like takes bumps, you know, gets people on his hip, like stuff like that. And – um, it just hasn't worked as well. And I think you need Kalkbrenner for that because Kalkbrenner obviously does draw so much attention. And obviously, he probably played his best basketball when Kalkbrenner was around. But it shouldn't be like this without Kalkbrenner, right? Like, there has to be at least a, a respectable floor for the whole team, not just him, when Kalkbrenner's out. And um, I think some of his rebounding has maybe taken away from that. Like, some of his rebounding has, like, hid some of that. But last game, like – even while he shot well, like the the holes in his game were glaring to mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Um, I also think <coughs> that, and this is going to sound weird because, you know, you look at Kaluma, for instance, and you say that's a, that's a phenomenal athlete. But I think Creighton is getting exposed a little bit by, by just not being the most athletic team on the floor. Sure. Um, and, you know, some of that is not having a seven-footer who, who can defend the rim and catch lobs. But – Creighton is not overwhelming from an athletic standpoint. And if you're not going to make 37% of threes, (laughs) like you got to be an above average athletic team to score. And they're not right now. Yeah. And and with Shireman, that's like we knew that from him, right? And we still expected, like I said, for him to be able to get people on his hip and get pain touches whenever and then kick out from there. Um, Because that's like the name of the game these days, right? Drive and kick. and for there to be games like last game where, um, you know, guys are standing around maybe because they don't want to complicate a space, that that to me seems like a, a locker room thing, like a miscommunication thing at a certain point. Like, it's like, oh, uh, maybe someone on the wing who's watching him create is like, man, you if you need this much space and you this and that, you need a perfect situation, I'm going to stay out your way, bro. Right, you know? right. And, and that's when it gets to, to be like me, like, Man, how bad do you need Kalkbrenner? And and so uh, you're right. Like that, the whole athletic thing, that the athlete thing, it's complicated because the best vertical athlete among them is probably Kaluma, and uh, it, it it makes for a versatile pro. But he's still not the greatest he, vertical he, athlete. He's either. not. A, he's not a super vertical athlete. Trey's not a not dynamic athletically. Uh, yeah. Nemhard's Nemhard's still six foot. As he's much an, as, as high he, as he can yeah, jump, he's, he's still an six average foot. athlete. Yeah. You know, he's an average guard. Uh, they're just not very overwhelming athletically, and 
they haven't quite figured out how to play off of each other. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's it's really surprising. And and you go into a stretch now, they get three home games in a row. Uh, if the weather cooperates, sure. Uh, Creighton's got to get this right in the next two weeks, Joel. I mean, this is like I'm not saying it's crunch time because there's a long season beyond that. But if they're gonna <laughs> fix the momentum of this thing, I really feel like it's got to happen against Butler. You know, in DePaul, uh, th- these are these are really critical weeks for Creighton's season, and, and you would think that it, it finally gives them an opportunity to to sort of get right. Yeah, and and you're not just expecting like like to me, if the verticality is lacking and the athleticism is lacking, like you say, on top of the the shot making, like I expect smart decision making, like not boofing possessions in the half quarter having 18 turnovers like you have to at least take care of it to stay alive and so I think that part of it um is something that they really can work on like obviously you can't really work on athleticism I think that part of it is something you can work on and other intangible stuff has been lacking like uh it's been a theme like the whole heart grit thing like um Sharif Mitchell said that they've probably been working toward it but they they lacked it during the stretch and Ryan Nimar said it was like you either got it or you don't and I'm looking at this team, and I don't know how many of them really got it. Uh, and, like, just looking at the grand scheme of things, like, I think Kalk Brenner has it more than anybody. Like, he gets the job done regardless. Like, dude has been sick for who knows how long, probably dating back to the Arizona game when he got cooked. And he's still trying to do his job. I, I, I don't really think any of it matters to him. And so I think they need – but he, the problem with him is he's not a vocal guy. So, like, as tough as he is – the vocality is is not there, man. So um, I think him being back means everything for them, which is also a problem in itself because injuries are going to happen. I'm, I'm not wishing injuries on him, obviously. But um, he is their most important player, and he might be a top five most important player in college basketball. Man. Yeah. For, for, I mean, you've seen it. You've seen it firsthand through these past few games. Like losing to BYU is a direct result of not having that guy. Yeah, it's – um. It's a tough situation. I also think that there's an element of this, and you know we've referenced this in the past, but man, when you when you have Final Four aspirations, when you're the the conference championship pick, when you you know climb into the top ten in the first month of the season, everybody on your schedule says we're going to go hard against those guys, right? And that's that's a target that you got to wear whether you're struggling or not, everybody's still like you go to Marquette, they want to beat Creighton, man. Like yeah. Marquette traditionally is a better program than <laughs> Creighton, but they saw what Creighton was at the, at the start of the year. Yeah. They want to, they want to prove themselves, you know? And I think Creighton's struggling with that a little bit too. Just the sense that, that everybody's after him a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know how much that changes even as they're struggling. In some ways I think it makes it even harder because, because people sort of want to kick them when they're down. So. Uh, yeah, and you saw that uh, the other day, right? Like, and and inc- kudos to Marquette too, because they were picked like ninth in the poll, and they look like one of the top three teams in in the league after wins over Baylor and and Notre Dame at at, at Notre Dame and um, whooping the hell out of Creighton. Like, they've looked really good. Um, but yeah, like they they show no no mercy. Like, no, they, they really whooped on Creighton. Uh, and it was just a constant, like, they punked them, man, um, probably more than anybody has. And so you get down the line, I mean, obviously this is a, a real bullish league, a really uh, a real tough league in terms of uh, physicality. I don't know it gets easier for them on that front. Like, you're probably going to see more teams that are going to want to kick you when you're down, like you say. Now, Creighton has a, a bit of a trump card here, and that is the home court because sure. during this stretch – They've only lost one of these six games at home, uh, the Nebraska arguably game. Arguably the worst one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, arguably the worst one. But but they haven't – they have a chance because of the home court to sort of regain their edge, I think. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see again here in the next two weeks if they can do that. Uh, obviously, the most pressing matter is, is whether the snowstorm is going to affect – you know Thursday's game against Butler, yeah. uh, but but you would think that that even if that one gets postponed, you know Creighton still has an edge against DePaul and then um, Seton Hall. 
and then Seton Hall. Yeah. So uh, I think Creighton has a chance here in part because of the home court to get right. Uh, obviously, getting the big man back would help. So yeah. let's transition to the Huskers, uh, who, Joel, it was a really interesting reminder the other day. <laughs> when you are uh, when you're undersized, uh, or I'm sorry, when you're uh, underskilled, you don't make a lot of jump shots, you're offensively <coughs> deficient, you better freaking play harder than the other team. Sure. And Nebraska didn't. And uh, and really got punished down in Kansas City. K State K State beat them up pretty good. Um, it was it was uh, arguably Nebraska's worst performance of the year, sure. and uh, also six and six. So it's uh, it's thought, huh? it's been a really tough stretch for for uh, for the Huskers too. And uh, you know I, I think that game down there sort of reset maybe a little bit of the concerns of a month ago, which was. Man, I don't know how this team wins games if they don't if they don't just get after the get after the opponent. So, uh, what are your thoughts on the Huskers as they as they complete a really tough stretch game stretch of games and uh, get a chance to breathe a little bit before uh, before conference play? Yeah, you could say that. They, they, their next few games are should be a cakewalk. But um, I will say, uh, like Creighton's fan base has found, well, probably not in the past week, but before it really felt like Creighton was tumbling, like there was some moral victories to be found right now. On the front of moral victories, like I think Nebraska got it, bro. Like um, losing to IU without Grizzle, right? Um, by you know I think fourteen or or so. Like that's that's encouraging. I'd say like you could easily say, oh yeah, Sam Grizzle in that game changes that game. Uh, and then taking Purdue to overtime, I think, is really encouraging in terms of uh, moral victories. I don't know uh, what the ceiling is for this team, but I do know if it just feels like a team that could catch a good team on a random night and just knock them off. Like, this is a team that really could piss people off, I think. Yeah, no, that's a good way to put it. But they've got to play. They've got to bring an intensity level. Um you know, if they if they take a night off, they're going to get thumped because skill wise, they just, you know, they're deficient. Uh, they're offensively deficient. I mean, they've scored, Joel in regulation. You know, they haven't hit seventy points. Well, they haven't hit seventy points period since the Boston College game. But uh, they they just have a hard time scoring. So defensively, you know, they they have to play so hard against good teams, and they do it. They did it against Creighton. They did it against uh, Purdue. Uh, they didn't do it against K State. I'm sorry, they dropped to six and seven. Uh, so they get Queens, uh, Queens University, which surprisingly is uh, a little bit better than advertised. Uh, and then they move into conference play with with Iowa coming in to to Pinnacle Bank Arena, uh, which even without the students around over winter break will generate a, a good crowd. Uh, and then you know then they hit the road. But uh, I think Nebraska is in a place right now where. You know the edge that they showed against Creighton and Purdue. You know is is something that it's going to be a battle of attrition because they have to bring it every single night. And I think uh, you know if they do, especially at home, I think they can play and and beat anybody on their schedule. If they don't, you know they're going to lose a lot of games, seventy one fifty six, as they did against against <laughs> Kansas State. So, um, what is your take on? What is your take on sort of the Big Ten and the Big East, you know, at large, compared to maybe your preseason expectations? Uh, well, the Big Ten is better than the Big East to me. Um, the Big Ten is better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I, I agree. And the Big East is probably a step down from what I thought it was going to be. Still, I think probably like fourth among major conferences, which isn't saying much because the Pac-12 is, is shitty these days. But, um, you know – I will say for the Big East, like the fact that well, one, um, maybe top heavy. I mean, they probably got the best team in the country, but from there, I mean, you're looking at Xavier, Marquette. I mean, Creighton when they're at their best uh, is another good team to have in your top tier. But Marquette's good, but like, what can they? How deep can they go in March? Right, um, Xavier. How deep can they go in March? Like these are your best teams, and then there's like a drop off. Like Saint, I want to put Saint John's there, but they just haven't played anybody. Um, so I I don't know what to make of the Big East yet, uh, but it, I'm not as impressed as I thought I would be. And then uh, the Big Ten, 
um, Purdue being as good as it is is probably what makes this conference better than w- what we thought. Yep. Michigan State, uh, I don't think they're ranked right now, but they've had some good wins and some good games. Uh, a relatively decent resume to speak for. Uh, Iowa is is good again this year. Uh, you know, Chris Murray is is an exceptional guy. Um, Illinois. <laughs> They've had some strange things happen to them, but they also have really good wins. Like they're still a good team. Like I think you look across the board. Maryland, Maryland is better. Maryland is probably one of the biggest surprises of the college basketball season. Maybe we we underestimated Kevin Willard. Like I think across the board, the Big Ten is just overall surprising. It's just solid, you know. <laughs> like I'm looking at the at Ken Palm right now, and there there's so many Big Ten teams in the top forty. It's almost it's almost you know laughable and that's probably closer to what i thought the Big East would be i thought there would be a, a number of teams in the top 45 for the Big East. yeah uh what is your what's your take on the hoosiers you know i know you you grew up not too far from that program they're uh yeah and i was covering them a, a, a few months back they got drilled at, they got drilled at allen field house last weekend uh what's your take on iu it's just levels levels to that man i think they're still a pretty good team uh just level they're one of the teams i thought benefited from the way their season ended too there was a uh, you know, I watched Michigan State whoop them in their own building like earlier in conference play last year. And, um, you know, fast forward a couple months, uh, they have pieces that are encouraging. And um, they end up, I don't remember if they lost in the second round or what it was, but the way they finished their season felt like such a big turnaround from the games I had watched um, and covered. And so um, – they that was another fan base that was like, yeah, IU, we gonna come back with all our guys next year, and we gonna beat y'all. Watch, like we we come back better than ever, and um, they're they're better than they were a year ago, but um, still, obviously, some growing to do if they want to be a uh, Kansas, obviously. So um, I think they fit in with that group of UNC and, and Creighton in terms of uh, teams that benefited from uh, off season expectations, but I just don't know how far you get with with Trace Jackson Davis as your first option. And uh, they got other kinks to work out. But I um, like this team more than I like last year's. I'll say that. Do you um, <clears throat> do you buy the UConn Huskies? I do, man. I do. Do you uh, buy them as the number one team in the country? Well, I always like Houston as the best team in the country. I think they showed that against Virginia. And they'll probably be ranked number one again or number two or something like At that. At some point. Yeah. Um, so – um, Houston is is my pick because I I watch Houston and that's the best defense in the country to me on top of already having dudes on dudes on dudes like they're elite and they got probably they got my I don't want to call him favorite coach in college basketball but he's definitely up there in terms of best coach yeah. in college Nebraska basketball. probably could have hired him at some point yeah but um but yeah Houston is it to me but I think UConn's right there like legitimately like if you told me if you gave me a case for UConn number one I probably wouldn't argue super hard with you like um. They just they got a great first option in, in Sonogo. Um, they got great secondary pieces in and Jordan Hawkins and, and Andre Jackson. Like these are these guys are great starters anywhere in the country, let alone for for UConn. Like for these dudes to all come together and they they have one of the best freshmen in the country in in Klingon and um, the guys that come off their bench like Tristan Newton like would be starting point guards elsewhere. Like um, the depth that they have is really I think what Creighton thought they had. Um, so you look across the board, and they've beaten some really great teams handily. Like they, Alabama is the only team to beat Houston. Um, and Alabama's a talented team. Don't get me wrong. UConn handily, handily beat Alabama, man. On top of the rest of their resume, so UConn's the only team uh, in Ken Palm with with top ten offense and defense. Yep. Their seventh offensive efficiency. Their third defensive efficiency. That is really really hard to do. So. Uh, last thing, Joel, and we'll get you out on this. Is it time for the Big Ten, for the Big East to finally expel DePaul University, <laughs> your proud Chicago institution? Hey, don't attach me to them, man. <laughs> the, the, that's the thing. At what point did they get the Temple University treatment from like 20 years ago in football and just get booted out of their league? Oof, I don't know because it, it's not looking any better for them, right? Like, no. You, like, bro, I'm, I'm from Chicago. Nobody gives a shit about DePaul, dog. Like, <laughs> like, 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 nobody grows up there and says, "Yeah, I want to put on for the city. Let's hoop at DePaul." Like, the closest you'll get to that, I think, was like, like Io, like went to the high school like five minutes from from my uh, the the crib I grew up in um, before he transferred to Morgan Park, and 
that was the closest thing you like. He went to and he Illinois. went to Champaign. Yeah, yeah. He went to Illinois. That was the closest thing you were gonna get. Like Adam Miller. Adam Miller's not from Chicago. He played in Chicago, but he's from like Peoria. Um, ended up at Illinois. Like that. That pipeline is the closest thing you'll get to to staying home. Nobody's going to uh, like, dude. People are going to Loyola Chicago probably before they're going to DePaul. Like that says. That speaks volumes. So why are they in the Big East? Kick them out. I don't know, man. They probably riding off the coattails of like Corey Maggette and shit. Still, like that. I I don't. I honestly don't know why. I don't want to shit on them, but like it's really hard to not. I mean, we're talking about DePaul. Like, like Georgetown isn't holding on because of his brand. Like Georgetown is easily the worst team in the league. Well, okay. But it can't. It can't get booted out, right? Like it. Yeah, it's, it's Georgetown. It's Georgetown. But DePaul. DePaul has nothing going for it. Like they're they're not good. They haven't had good teams. They don't have a good brand. Nobody from the city wants to go there. Nobody from the state wants to go there. Like <laughs> I, I I don't know what to make of DePaul these days. I do. I knew if I brought that up, it would elicit some sort of response. It's only appropriate that you spend Christmas Day with DePaul University, Joel. Yeah, I'm. I'm just so delighted. Just to have a taste of the crib here, <laughs> and, um, instead of being able to go to the crib. Yes, Christmas yes, show. man. Why can't why, why couldn't we get you a road game at DePaul? That would right? have been perfect uh, for you I, like on uh, Christmas Day. And I was talking about this when the schedule came out. Like as as up in arms as I was about having to cover a game on Christmas instead of just enjoying my beloved family. Um, I I wish like I am one of those sickles who still watches basketball all day oh, of on course. Christmas. But like, dude, make it in my city, please. Like, <laughs> they, I'll really, I'll really cover the hell out that game if yes. it was. But I, I'm gonna cover the hell out of this game. Uh, you just I know wi- Sam is listening. You but. just wish it was 500 miles to the east. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, uh, cri- these Christmas games are always, you know, they're always somewhat iffy. Uh, you don't know what kind of crowd you're gonna get. Um, you know, Creighton playing on Christmas. That'll be interesting. It, it, I mean, it's never happened in school history. I mean, you don't know team, And it's especially, it, there are some talking points with this thing, especially coming from a, a religious school. And um, it's, I mean, we could sit here for a while and talk about it. But Yeah, it, it, and it's one thing if it was like Creighton Villanova or Creighton Man, UConn. Don't get me started. But are, we, are we seriously putting Creighton DePaul on, on Christmas Day? Well, you know, obviously Marcus Blossom is, is the man. Uh, responsible and he's a Chicago guy so I'm sure he has something to do with that just like he had something to do with Holy Cross coming to town there you go be down so. there you go all right that's it for the half court press podcast uh we'll be back uh sometime over over the holidays here to to reassess the Huskers and the Jays uh I got my eye on that Nebraska Iowa game next week Joel because uh nothing brings out Husker uh bloodthirst more more than the Hawkeyes coming to town so mm. uh there will be some interesting basketball here over the next uh, seven to ten days and uh we'll be back next time to uh, to evaluate it thanks for listening for Joel I'm Dirk have a great holidays <laughs>